Welcome to the 20th episode of the New Age Christian Synthesis Podcast. The podcast was created to provide honest truth seekers with food for thought and potentially a sense of belonging as well. We took a break for a few weeks, but we're back now with weekly episodes to be released on a semi-regular basis. This week's topic is of particular interest to most Christians and New Agers alike. My personal study of materials about the afterlife and the near-death experience phenomenon is what eventually led me to conclude that there is much truth to be found in both approaches to God. Of all the teachers who come from a middle ground between these approaches, J.J. Dewey seemed to me to be the best at bridging the two in a way that makes sense and feels right. Since I've taken the following excerpts from classes given on a variety of occasions, There is some overlap of subject matter, but not too much. And now, J.J. Dewey. I thought I'd talk about uh, uh, the different spheres we go to after the physical, a little bit about what's involved. First of all, how many different planes are there? Seven. Seven. Right, there were seven different planes. Seven non how many physical planes? Three. How many planes of form? Three. Right, three planes of form. We have the physical, etheric, which really counts as one plane because the physical and etheric are intertwined. And after you die, you're only in your etheric body, body usually for a short period of time. Some people bypass the etheric body entirely because the etheric body is like an electrical system that keeps your body in shape. And after you die, your etheric body immediately, immediately begins to dissipate. Now, the ancient Egyptians had certain methods that they used to try to sustain the, the etheric body after death. They were able to do this to a degree, and even after the person left his body, they had different methods of uh, capturing the etheric energy so it, it hung around the, the grave. And this, the curse, for instance, of King Tut was... Uh, because of the use of the Egyptians uh, use of capturing that etheric energy that vital force that surrounds the bodies that they it uh, kind of lingered around the tomb for all those years and thus the, the curse curse that they put on it uh, lingered with it the etheric body begins to fall apart right after you die no- normally unless uh, extreme measures are taken to preserve some of its energy then the next step up is the astral world. The astral world is created out of emotional energy. And it has uh, seven different subdivisions in it. And the lower divisions of the astral world are what we would call hell. And the thing about the afterlife is each person goes to where his vibration feels comfortable. This is why it's important to obey the injunction of Jesus to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Because if you do that, then you'll go to a place where there's others that treat others the way you treat them. And if you treat others good, you'll be treated good there. And being around these type of people will make it a pleasant afterlife existence. On the other hand, if you're a very selfish person, then your vibration will be lower and you will go to a place where other very selfish people reside and this will make it a hell. In that book by that Larry recommended there, they talk about, it was interesting how the grass was different in each one of the spheres. In the lower spheres, the grass was, which was the hells, the grass was parched. And then a little bit higher, it felt just really good and the vibrant colors and then the higher spheres the grass was just really bright and it felt really alive and the the grass seemed to get better the higher they went which I found kind of interesting there but in the next world the astral body seems as physical as our physical body but when our physical body touches another physical body we feel like it's solid 
But in reality, our physical body isn't very solid at all. It's amazing how much of it is empty space. Now, in the next world, it's composed of, of atoms, but a little bit different type of atom. But still, that is also mostly empty space. So much empty space that even in this empty space, it can pass through. Oh. If we, there might be an astral being right there. Matter of fact, um, Sean. Sean. Well, I don't know why I have such a hard time with the name, Sean. Sean uh, has been seeing guides around people tonight, and they were, uh, uh, and I'm sure if there's a guide right here, my hand would pass right through them. They're made of a more refined matter, but each, each, wherever there's physical form, when the form touches form, it uh, there's an actual sensation of touch. That's interesting, uh, considering the communication in the lower worlds. In the very lowest part of the um, astral world, they'll talk just like we do. As you move up in the astral world into the intermediate spheres, when they talk, they can talk either as we do or they can send uh, different types of messages kind of in like packages. Downloads. What? Downloads. Yeah. Roads. And then as you move up further, they don't talk at all, but they just send messages by mental telepathy and sometimes they'll come like and they'll get a flash of color and then the message will just be understood by them after they see that like flash of color the yeah <coughs> and the vision isn't interfered with like here instead of just here if Sean was four times farther away I wouldn't be able to tell it was Sean but in the astral world if he's like apparently a thousand miles away you could still see him like he's up close. And you could think about him being here and he could be here. In the lower worlds, communication and travel is similar to the way it is here, but the higher you get, the faster everything gets. Eventually, you get in the higher parts of the astral world, you can crisscross if you want to see a friend a thousand miles away, you just can just think yourself there and you can be there instantaneously. And time is different than it is here in the fact there is really no time to reckon. So some people say there's no time in the astral world or the uh, other worlds. But there is time. There's time everywhere. But time just isn't measured everywhere. Because if uh, in our world here we have to go to work, we have to set ourselves by the rising and setting of the sun, but in a world where there's eternal light and no change that causes you to measure time, and you don't think about time. And that's why some people have said there's no time in the astral world, that it's in a state of timelessness. <coughs> it seems that way, but when you're in the astral world, time still passes. And it still takes time to learn things, absorb things, take things in. But because it seems like you have all the time in the world, it seems like time doesn't exist. But the interesting thing about time is it always exists. But there are many places we can go in the higher spheres where it does not seem to exist because we're not uh, uh, reckoning by it. Now in the astral world, you have teachers who go from one sphere to another and assist and help the people down there. A person can move from one sphere to another when he learns his lessons and, and the, the teachers will often come down, they'll be bathed in light, they'll come down to the lower worlds and they will teach the people their lessons they need to learn to go to the next sphere up. And then when they're ready to learn, uh, to, to accept their lessons and once they learn them, then they can go to the next sphere up and they can uh, better prepare for the next life to come. But another interesting thing about the astral world, a lot of people say, well, it's going to be interesting to find out when I die because I'm going to find out all the mysteries. Well, you don't really find out all the mysteries right after you die. It's, you, got, you just have more questions after you die because normally you don't meet God or Jesus that sits there and explains everything to you. But then you read the book, Embraced by the Light, well, she immediately met Jesus 
and uh, he explained a whole bunch of stuff to her. So what goes on here? What happened there? The thing is, the Christ himself is on the earth right now in the <coughs> physical body. He's not even in the astral world. He can take a visit there if he wants to because he has power to visit any of the worlds that he wants. But he is actually in a physical body right now and he actually lives on the earth. He said, Behold, I am with you even until the end of the age, he told his disciples. And what he meant by this is that he would be upon the earth until the end of the age. He would be living here with us. So first of all, let's look at the near-death experiences a little bit. First thing to look at is a lot of people come back with different things. Mrs. Miss Edie had kind of a Mormon background, so she saw kind of the standard pre-existence of the Mormon doctrine, and she saw a lot of Mormon doctrine uh, affirmations for herself with certain little twists on them, like uh, Hitler being in heaven, for instance. Uh, she wasn't a standard Mormon, but she was uh, kind of... Um, uh, loosely into it with some ideas of her own and the ideas that she had were reflected in her near-death experience. Now she saw in there that there was no reincarnation. Yet the interesting thing is the majority of people that have near-death experiences are told there is reincarnation. So why was Mrs. Edie told there wasn't reincarnation when the majority of people that have near-death experiences are told that there is? Uh, somebody's not correct here. When a Buddhist has a near-death experience, he won't see Jesus uh, there on the other side, but he'll see Buddha. Uh, when a Christian has a near-death experience, he'll see uh, Jesus. Uh, if a good Mormon has a near-death experience, he might see Joseph Smith. So what's going on here? Does everybody just see in the next world what they want to see? Well, this is kind of the story of the astral world. The astral world is a world that is not real. Um, DK tells us that the astral world is a like a lower reflection of the mental world. The mental world is built on true principles, and it has a true reality. But the astral world is based is created solely on illusion, and one day. Uh, we will not be affected by it at all. But for now, in our state of evolution, uh, the astral world is very powerful. The astral world is built out of matter which is governed by emotional energy. The mental world is built out of matter which is governed by thought. And so the astral world is called, all another name for it is the desire world. In other words, it's a world where our desires are materialized for us. And the majority of people are polarized or grounded in their emotional desire, astral energy. And because of this, when they die, desi when they, die they um, go to the astral world and they go to a, a place which is conditioned by their thought, especially right after death or with a near-death experience. People will often not see a true reality, but see the fulfillment of their desires and uh, see that their beliefs uh, kind of represented by a, um, a, rea um, a reality that is of their own creation. And this is why you have people with near-death experiences having many different things. I mean, a lot of them go to, uh, well, about 10 or 20 percent of them go to a, a hell and where well, there's burning fires and devils with pitchforks and scared the daylights out of several of these people I've read about that had an experience like this. And this was uh, created by their emotional feelings. They evidently felt guilty, and because of this guilt and religion hammered into them, they uh, uh, feel they're not worthy of heaven. So when they have their near-death experience, they see uh, a hell awaiting them. And this kind of was a big shock to people who have had this experience. One of the main teachings of Buddha is to get 
control of our desires. So we become the master of our desires so that when we, after we die, we are not trapped in illusion, but we can uh, go to a place where there is a true reality, which he called nirvana. Nirvana is a nothing. That's the way some people in the West have interpreted it. But not, it's a place where there's no illusion. And which would be nothingness maybe from some people's point of view that are really trapped in a lot of illusion and uh, don't have much rea true reality in their lives. But for the true seeker, the higher worlds are are merely a higher reality, which is really a lot better reality than we are in right here as far as pure enjoyment goes. So is Hitler in heaven? Actually, his personality is not in heaven, but is all of our souls, the higher parts of our nature are in heaven from that point of view. I, I guess you could say she's right. But uh, uh, that's because uh, all of us have a higher part of ourselves. But we are not at one with that higher part of ourselves. If we were at one with that higher part of ourselves, we would be harmless. But we as personalities where our consciousness dwells in the physical, in the feeling, in the mind, uh, we are capable of creating grievous errors, which we have to face not only in this world, but in the world to come. So in the next world, we, go, we uh, first of all, right after we die, we are in our etheric physical double for a period of time until that dissipates, and then we find ourselves centered in our astral body, most of us do. Unless a person is fairly highly evolved, he'll go right to his, his, uh, the body of his mind. And in your astral body, uh, you will dwell in the astral world until, uh, if, you're, if a person is astrally grounded, until he nears a time for rebirth, and then he will c kind of merge back with the soul and then descend back into matter again. So if Hitler is still in his astral body, he's uh, um, I wouldn't think he would be in much of a heaven. He may still be uh, convinced that he's right as far as that goes. But uh, he wouldn't be in any more heaven there than he was here. And he, he wasn't in very much of a heaven here. He, uh, he was... Uh, uh, he'd get so angry sometimes he'd, he'd roll on the floor and chew on the carpet. And that type of uh, feeling and anger and animosity toward other people will carry over to the astral world so that uh, you'll be able to, another person will actually be able to see these feelings emanating from this individual in the astral world. And it'd be kind of embarrassing for many of us to have uh, our feelings totally exposed for others to see. Now imagine if um, you were to die and go live amongst people exactly or very closely to your type of feeling and your type of thinking. Would that be heaven or hell? So if Hitler is in heaven, or Hitler, you want to know if Hitler is in heaven, just imagine if Hitler was living with, say, a thousand other people, that thought the same way that he did and ask yourself would this be heaven and there you have your answer another illusion in Mrs. Zidi's um, uh, after death experience was, was that she met Jesus it seemed like every Christian meets Jesus and every Buddhist meets Buddha and so on and Harry Krishna's meet uh, Krishna and boy how do these guys get around so much well, who did Mrs. Edie meet? I mean, uh, Christ is upon the earth right now in a physical body. He's not up in heaven somewhere. He said, I will be with you until the end of the age. And he is with us. He hasn't really left the earth. And so he's really not in heaven. So what did she meet when she went there? Well, what she saw was a reflection of her solar angel, and the solar angel represents a Christ consciousness. So in a way of speaking, she saw the Christ because it was a, a reflection 
of the Christ consciousness which was talking to her and this was he who she thought was the Christ and uh, so we see a reflection of our solar angel before we meet the solar angel itself because the average person isn't ready to meet his true solar angel so the solar angel reflects himself down in the astral world but the reflection of the solar angel uh, often will teach some things that are upside down but it will be things that will be encouraging for the person to live a good life so they can eventually face their illusions Mrs. Uh, Edie when she came back from her near-death experience she was motivated to be a better person so her solar angel on reflecting itself and talking to her actually uh, helped her along even though uh, there was still a lot of illusion involved that's part of the great plan give us all the illusion that we can handle until we're ready to come out of the illusion because the average person loves illusion he wants to be tricked he wants to be tricked into believing what he wants to believe and not let the facts get in the way and so the reflection of our solar angel and the reflection of the higher energies are here to let us be uh, will make us like actors in a play where nothing the play isn't really real but we play things out until we learn the lessons from the play and then we finally decide you don't want to play anymore but you want to enter into the real world then um, uh, that time you're you will are nearing the time when you can face your true solar angel or the true divine presence Okay, from the bottom of the astral world to the top, there's tremendous difference. At the top, it's very close to the um, uh, mental world. But the astral world, and to, since half a year of Mormons, is really the terrestrial kingdom. The telestial kingdom is what? It's this earth right here. Matter of fact, when you go to the Mormon temple, they, they say right in it, <coughs> brothers and sisters, this is a lone and dreary world the telestial kingdom. It's called the lone and dreary world, the telestial kingdom, the world in which we now reside. So this world and all the stars up there is all part of the telestial kingdom. And the telestial kingdom is what ministered to by the Holy Spirit. And that's how we're ministered to in this world, by the Spirit. If we're a true seeker, we'll feel an inward spirit come to us and verify and give us truth. And that's how we're ministered to in this telestial world. The next step up is a terrestrial, and that's the astral world. And most of us go there after we die. But, um, well, the upper parts of the astral world would be the terrestrial anyway. The lower parts would be, I guess, what is in the Bible called the spirits in prison, for want of a better word. <coughs> but the upper parts is what is called heaven... The upper parts of the astral world is in the esoteric writings is called the Deva chain. It's the Deva chain they teach is like a, a dream world. In other words, uh, everybody's having their own dream, their pleasant dreams, and it seems really real, but it's a little bit like a dream world in the fact that everything is governed by the power of feeling and thought. But it, when you're there, it seems just as real as anything. But there's also, in the lower parts, there's different religions. There'll be Methodists and Mormons, and they'll all have their individual groups. They'll maintain their teachings, and most of them will not believe in reincarnation. It's interesting, when they did a survey <coughs> among people that had near-death experiences, about 60% of them learned in the, their near-death experiences there was reincarnation. About 40% were told there wasn't reincarnation that's because they went different places you know if they went where the regular religious people go they'd say no this is pretty much it you know we might maybe move on to the higher spheres but they basically will believe the standard teachings they'll be waiting for Jesus to show up matter of fact sometimes if a person dies and he's really into 
religious teachings, and there's really no place for him in the astral world. They'll uh, arrange a greeting uh, a group for them, and they'll arrange kind of a play situation where he will come and meet Jesus and and have like an environment that he's expecting to have after he dies until he kind of gets used to it and then they'll start explaining to him, you know, this isn't really real. <laughs> We're going to take you now to the real astral world. <laughs> okay, now in the mental world, what's different about the mental world is when you want something, you create it with your mind. In the astral world, you create it with your feelings. <clears throat> if you want an apple, you feel a desire for an apple, and the apple can materialize. If you're in the mental world, you just think an apple, and the apple will materialize. And <clears throat> they say you have, you know, similar... You don't have to eat in uh, the spirit worlds, but uh, you can eat for your own enjoyment because we're so used to eating here that you can eat there also. Now another question that Larry's book didn't answer was how do they have sex there or do they have sex? <coughs> and they do have sex, but it's different than it is here. There, what, what happens, they create like a charge of energy. And you can, <coughs> if you don't have sex with them, the opposite sex, all you do is you, you, you you don't have the regular physical relations, but you just look at each other and you exchange energy, and all of a sudden you're just <laughs> zapped, you know? And which one is that, the mental or the world? That's in the astral worlds, okay. yeah. Another question people have is, well, what happens if a person commits suicide? Or has a very catastrophic, uh, or a gets blown up, dies instantly, or something like that. That's what uh, happens to these people. If a person commits suicide, uh, the general teaching is, is that they will sleep until they would have normally died. For instance, if a person commits suicide when they're 20 and they would have normally died when they're 50, they would normally sleep in the spirit world for up to 30 years, and then they'd wake up at the, their normal time of death. Now, I don't believe this is a hard and fast rule, but I feel that there's truth behind it. I feel they will sleep for a period of time. They'll eventually be given another chance, but suicide is always creates karma because the person was in a terrible situation in his life, or at least he thought he was, and he decided to escape it, and there was a lesson to learn there by facing it. So he'll eventually have to come back in a similar circumstance and face it until he's finally willing to work through it rather than take his life. Why would they sleep? <clears throat> Why would they just uh, wake up or whatever? Well, because energy follows thought. See, and he was trying to extinguish his life, and all he has power to extinguish was the not his eternal life, but the life that he would have led on the earth. And so because energy follows thought. I don't believe this is a hard and fast exact rule, but it uh, is uh, like a general rule with exceptions, you know. And I think a lot of them wake up earlier before they, uh, their actual time of death. But also, uh, if a person dies with an explosion or something really sudden, his actual spirit body will be, astral body will be in a state of shock and he's actually met there by the spirit doctors there that assist him in his recovery. It's impossible to, like, destroy the astral body with an explosion or a car crash or anything like that, but the, the sudden death is somewhat of a shock to the system that they need a little bit of rest in the spirit world before they're able to function entirely. Now, some people wonder, well, what, what would happen if you were, had a direct hit by atomic bomb? Would that hurt your astral? Well, that's what Woody keeps asking. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, it would be a shock to the system. I think you need a little rest and recovery, but I don't think it would destroy your astral body, you know, or do any permanent damage to it. Some people are theorizing that it would, but um, haven't seen any teaching on it uh, by anyone I would trust one way or another. But uh, my gut feeling is, is that nothing we could do here can 
create any permanent harm to our astral body unless we do it ourselves through our own negligence. But all these are temporary residences, all except for the people that are dedicated to the path of darkness. And these don't, don't even go to the astral world, they go to what is written in the esoteric writings as the eighth sphere, which is actually a lower vibration than the actual physical. And the eighth sphere is what in Mormon language that the sons of perdition will go to, where their bodies, act, their, their being, everything that composes them begins to break down. And then they're recycled in the recycling pit of God, so to speak. And their, their soul eventually puts out a new personality and tries again to create a successful creation from the monad of the person. What we do with our, our thought in the physical body has more potency here than in the other worlds if we focus correctly. We have tremendous power of, of thought because the physical world combined with, we have within us the physical world combined with the astral, combined with the mental, we have, have the whole ball of wax here. So it takes more energy and power of thought to work in this world. It's like when you have working with heavy weights you get stronger and stronger. So this is a world where you you uh, really increase your power of will and power of thought. Whereas when you go to the lighter astral worlds everything is really easy, you just kind of glide along. And you don't have to exercise yourself quite so much. You know, it's a good place to learn and everything but it's the heavens are more a place of relaxation and rest. Matter of fact, the scriptures talk about this, great shall be the rest. The rest shall be glorious, it says. And it often calls the next world a, a rest. They shall rest from all their labors. And here we're not resting. We're, we're, it, it creates a strenuous act of will just to get out of bed here compared to the other world. You, just, you can just bound out of your bed, you know. So... <laughs> So if, if, if a person focuses in this world, he can create a tremendous influence in the next world. And sometimes when loved ones die, you can still have a feeling about them. Like I, uh, I'll tell you a couple experiences with me is I had a, an uncle that had MS that I really loved a lot. And uh, back when I was a Mormon, you, you give blessings, and I always wanted to give him a blessing and healing. And finally, when I got old enough to do that and was recognized as a priesthood holder, I asked my grandmother, who was care the caretaker of him, if I could give him a blessing. When I did, I, yeah, I didn't receive anything for him. I felt like, no, now's not the time. And I waited a couple of years, and I tried to give him another blessing. It was like my lips were almost sealed. I couldn't, I could just sputter out, couldn't hardly sputter out anything positive. I, so I told him he'd have peace of mind, you know. And I felt really bad about that. And then he got worse and worse. One day I was visiting him with my friend Wayne. And boy, he, he looked so bad, you know, he couldn't talk. He was just laying on the couch. He was kind of almost... Uh, I could tell he was really uncomfortable, and I felt really sorry for him. And as I was looking at him, the inner voice says, um, this man has suffered enough. Give him a blessing. Didn't tell me what to say, just said he suffered enough. So I figured if he suffered enough, and looking back upon it, I didn't understand karma at that time, but now I can understand he probably paid the debt that he was supposed to pay. And so I took Wayne, and we both laid our hands on him, and I blessed him that he would either be completely healed or else he would be taken. And I figured if he suffered enough, he's, one of those two things is going to happen. <laughs> so I gave him that blessing. And I went to, uh, I was in college at the time, and Wayne and I went back to college. And, and three days later, my mom called me up, three days after we gave the blessing. But just before her phone call, all of a sudden I felt Bob's presence. It was just really powerful. And he came to me to thank me. 
It's just, oh, it's so great to be free from that decrepit body I was in, you know. He was basically, I didn't get the words, but I got the, the feeling. He was just overjoyed. He was just so thankful to me for giving him that blessing that released him from the body. He was just thrilled to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom called me up, and she sounded really sad. She said, I got some really bad news. Bob died. I says, that's not bad news. I says, that's good news. I says, he's thrilled to be where he is. I mean, he's just thrilled. I says, really? What makes you think that? Well, he's, he's been hooving around me. He's just, he's just happy as a lark. And um, now, but when my mom died, I had a quite a bit different experience. Um, I felt when she died, she was somewhat confused because I think she was expecting the spirit world to be different because she had a certain idea of what heaven would be like and everything. And right after, and she was quite old, and right after she died, she was, her body, her spirit body still look, looked old. <laughs> and she probably, I got the impression she was expecting to look young, you know, and vibrant. But that took, uh, that takes a period of time for, for the changes to occur. And I had the impression that for, for three days I had the impression she was confused. And then after three days I felt she was okay, you know, that it's kind of taken care of. And I was talking to my daughter Elizabeth that I told you about, and I told her that. She says, you know, the same thing happened to me for three days. I felt the same thing you did. So that was interesting that we both had that same feeling for my mom. But, um, so... Yeah, it's uh, encouraging that uh, my uncle Bob was so thrilled to be free from his uh, terrible disease he had. He had it for like over 20 years, you know. So he was just he was just thrilled to be on the other side. Okay, uh, so but anyway, what we do here, we can actually create what we create the next heaven that we may go to with our minds while we're upon the earth. And we feed through our mental efforts and our mental calculations, we create the heavens and hells that materialize and change. The heavens and hells in the next world change as the times change and as technology changes and as circumstances change. And so it's important if you do any visualization or anything that you visualize the type of world you might want to live in in the next world and the type of people you might want to associate with and to create yourself as a type of person that good people want to associate with. In the next world there there's all kinds of things happening there governed by hierarchies. There are people set aside for helping people cross over and adjust to death. People that had a violent death go to like little ho hospitals there mm -hmm. with, little, with hierarchies governing how to, how to help those people recuperate and adjust to making the transition. And then there's all kinds of uh, uh, universities and libraries and places to study and learn and evolve and these are governed by hierarchies and all these hierarchies there are people out of the body you know and uh, uh, most of them are not masters they're just people like you and me that uh, in between lives we, we want to do stuff just like we do here so we organize there just like we organize here so if you want to know what the next world is like look at this world and extend say what do people in their spare time create here so what will they create there? The only difference is that you go to where your vibration is. Like uh, uh, Susan there has a nice vibration, sweet little gal. And so she, when she dies, she'll go among people like her. They're, they're courteous and treat you good. And the people that are uh, uh, the robbers and thieves and rapists, they won't even be around her because they're on a different vibration. And so you go to where your particular vi vibration is. So everybody around Susan likes to organize things. She's, she's uh, creating this um, uh, gather gathering she's got down there. And 
so she'd probably want to gather people there too, you know. So, she, and she would have a lot easier time there because the people she's associating with there are would be a lot like her, industrious and want to do things and want to cooperate, and so she'd be kind of she'd be kind of thrilled to work with these people because they're a lot like her. On the other hand. You, we all know somebody in our lives that it's just really hard to get along with. Imagine this person dying and going to a place where everybody's just like him in vibration. Uncooperative, swears, cusses like crazy, uh, is negative, criticizes everybody. Uh, well, he's, he's criticized all the time. Nobody cooperates with him. And in his sphere, nothing seems to get done. And everybody's really frustrated that lives around him. And this is one of the hells. And he's, he's living in one of these hells where everybody's criticizing, backbiting, gossiping. And uh, nobody can get anything done. Nobody trusts anybody. But Susan's over here in this other sphere. Everybody's trusting everybody. Everybody knows the other guy's going to do his job. And, and Susan thinks, boy, I don't know if I want to go back and incarnate or not, you know, because I'm having such a good time here. Everybody's so cooperative, and we're actually getting stuff done here. But after a while, Susan will think, well, it's getting a little too easy here. I, I really need a new challenge. So she hops back in another body and goes among the riffraff that's here again and tries to help him out some more. <laughs> A lot of people, if, if they need uh, continued lessons after death, they go to places where they're still an illusion for a period of time. And so uh, if, if you're really into your church and your church has a lot of illusion, you go to a place where everybody believes this, and then you're subject to the heaven of which you're expecting. And slowly you learn that that heaven isn't really heaven after all. It's like that Twilight Zone episode, remember that? This guy dies, and he's a mobster, and he's expecting to go to hell, and he's greeted by this angel, and the angel says, he says, well, what are you here for? And the angel says, I'm here to serve you. What do you want? He says, what, I can have anything I want? I thought I was going to hell. The angel says, well, I'm here to serve you. What do you want? He says, well, I want to go gamble. Okay, so he takes him gambling, and he wins every time. Boy, he says, well, this is great. And I want some women, and wine, and all kinds. So he kept ordering all these things. And after about three, four days of winning every time and having wine, women, and song, he says, boy, I'm getting bored here. He says, um, uh, maybe heaven isn't for me. Maybe I need to go to hell. And the angel says to him, well, where do you think you are? <laughs> So, so I thought that was a cute story. So the guy was in hell. He was in what he thought was heaven was really hell. And this is uh, this is going to be the case of many people. What when they die and expecting to go to heaven, when they go to what they expect, they're going to discover well, it's not heaven after all. So um, then, when they learn that lesson, then they'll be given the opportunity to move on and learn other lessons. But. They have to learn to escape that thought form, uh, that illusion that they're under uh, uh, after, after death. Before we came here, we were one with our souls, and we made a plan for our life as to what we want to accomplish. And we, can, we could look down and see approximately what's going to happen and the opportunities that's going to present themselves to us. And we can plan ahead on them. Now, nobody knows the future exactly, and even from the higher aspect of the soul, you can't predict everything that's going to happen. But consider, it's a little bit like this. Consider if you had a supercomputer and uh, you put all the information in it that was accessible to man. You could maybe predict the future, maybe the stock market pretty accurately. You could predict a lot of things that we can't predict now. If we had a super duper computer that had all the data in it and intelligently was able to put the data together. Well, this is the way it is from the other world. It's like the, the whole 
the spirit world itself is like a giant computer and it puts everything together and it projects what's going to happen and we can look and see and it can see maybe about 90 percent of our life pretty accurately but we always have free will and we can always screw things up and which is really pretty easy to do but anyway we look in conjunction with our soul that's in tune with the solar angel we can look and we can see what's going to happen and we can make plans as to what to do and we make plans as to um, what we're going to accomplish and in this life there are certain triggers that happen that we in conjunction with our soul plan certain things that created certain triggers so when we reach a certain point in our life we have maybe like a feeling a deja vu or something like that and we think boy this uh, I feel like I've been through this before and when you feel that way it's often because you're repeating something that you kind of rehearsed before you were born because you're looking into the future and planning your life and when you reach that crossroads where that plan is at a crucial point you'll have a feeling a deja vu or familiarity or that situation will seem familiar so th this uh, happens and it's important that we're in tune with our souls because if we're in tune with our souls when we reach these point, forks in our life that we don't know whether to go this way or this way there's one direction that our soul planned for us to take now every once in a while the soul doesn't care you know we reach a fork in our life and both of them will go pretty much the same way but there's many other times that we'll reach a fork where it's important we make the right decision and this is where it's important to have communion with our souls because if we have communion with our souls then we'll receive some type of clue now if we're really dense our soul might try to send us something in a dream state pay attention to your dreams especially if you reach in a, a point in your life maybe you're changing jobs or you're found the love of your life or something that's going to create a, a, a fork uh, where one decision will take you to entirely a different place than another decision it's important here to look for clues and the clues are given to us a number of different ways if the person is sensitive he'll just feel that for some reason I feel I need to take go this direction you will just feel right and when you take it it feels right and in this case your soul will be sitting back thinking oh he got the message good I can relax okay but many times it's not that easy with the soul sometimes we'll come to that fork and we'll be thinking which way should I go and you kind of want to go to the left but you so really want you to go to the right and you're kind of stubborn though you think well, it would be easier to go to the left but your soul wants you to go to the right and so your soul sees you're not listening so it gives you a dream and well you kind of ignore the dream and then when you wake up you forget about it so your soul thinks well what can I do next so maybe it speaks to the mind of some good friend of yours and and gives that friend an impression to tell you to make that decision going to the right and your friend says hey you know I think you should do this and still you ignore the guy you know well I really wanted to go this way because it's easier you know it's easier and I can have a good time the other ones if I choose the path to the right it's going to be a big struggle and so the soul will keep giving you clues as to the way that you're supposed to go and so it's important that we tune in and we be open. Thanks for listening to this episode of the New Age Christian Synthesis Podcast. If what you heard rang true, and you'd like to find out more, please visit J.J. Dewey's website at freeread.com. That's F-R-E-E-R-E-A-D dot com.